Delchio Sevi, a traditional song of flirtatious banter in the Cornish language, cited by William Price, M.D. of Raidruth, Cornwall, in his 1790 Archaeologia Cornu Britannica. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Son of the Exiles Delchio Sevi, Strawberry Leaves From the Archaeologia Cornu Britannica The English Translation of the Song Whither are you going, pretty fair maid, said he, with your white face and your yellow hair? I am going to the well, sweet sir, she said, for strawberry leaves make maidens fair. Shall I go with thee, pretty fair maid, said he, with your white face and your yellow hair? Do if you will, sweet sir, she said, for strawberry leaves make maidens fair. What if I do lay you down on the ground, with your white face and your yellow hair? I will rise up again, sweet sir, she said, for strawberry leaves make maidens fair. What if I do bring you with child? with your white face and your yellow hair. I will bear it, sweet sir, she said, for strawberry leaves make maidens fair. Who will you have for father for your child, with your white face and your yellow hair? You shall be his father, sweet sir, she said, for strawberry leaves make maidens fair. What will you do for whittles for your child, with your white face and your yellow hair? His father shall be a tailor, sweet sir, she said, for strawberry leaves make maidens fair. The Cornish Language Song Play ira wee moles, moles fettle teg, gen agus begeth quin, agus blue melon, me o moles than venton ser weg. Rag delkio sevi ura musiteg. Pi vi mos gena vi mos fetoteg. Gen agus begeth quin, agus blue melon. Gru mena vi sira weg. Rag delkio sevi ura musiteg. Fatla gura vi agus goro wien do, gen agus begeth quin, agus blue melon, mi veden sevul ata sera weg, rag delkio sevi ura musiteg. Fatla gura vi agus tri wigan flo, gen agus begeth quin, Agus blue melon, me vedden e thorn sero weg, rag delkio sevi ura musiteg. Pu vedden are we gavos rag sero ragas flo, gen agus begeth quin, agus blue melon, we rabos a sera. Sera weg, rag delkio sevi ura musiteg. Pandra veda we gal rag ledno ragas flo, gen agus begeth quin, agus blue melon. E sera vith treas sera weg, rag delkio sevi ura musiteg. Take. End of Delkio Sevi from William Price's 1790 Archaeologia Cornu Britannica Recording by Son of the Exiles Selections from How to Write a Play This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
Selections from How to Write a Play, edited by James Brander Matthews. Everyone writes in accordance with his inspiration and his temperament. Some sing a gay note, others find more pleasure in making people weep. As for me, this is my procedure. When I have no idea, I gnaw my nails and invoke the aid of Providence. When I have an idea, I still invoke the aid of Providence, but with less fervour, because I think I can get along without it. It is quite human, but quite ungrateful. I have then an idea, or I think I have one. I take a choir of white paper, linen paper, on any other kind I can imagine nothing, and I write on the first page, plan. By the plan I mean the developed succession, scene by scene, of the whole piece, from the beginning to the end. So long as one has not reached the end of his play, he has neither the beginning nor the middle. This part of the work is obviously the most laborious. It is the creation, the parturition. As soon as my plan is complete, I go over it and ask concerning each scene its purpose, whether it prepares for or develops a character or situation, and then whether it advances the action. A play is a thousand-legged creature which must keep on going. If it slows up, the public yawns. If it stops, the public hisses. To write a sprightly play, you must have a good digestion. Sprightliness resides in the stomach. Eugène Labiche You ask me how a play is made. By beginning at the end. A novel is quite a different matter. Walter Scott, the great Walter Scott, sat down of a morning at his study table, took six sheets of paper, and wrote chapter one, without knowing anything else about his story than the first chapter. He set forth his characters, he indicated the situation. Then situation and characters got out of the affair as best they could. They were left to create themselves by the logic of events. Eugène Sue often told me that it was impossible for him to draw up a plan. It benumbed him. His imagination needed the shock of the unforeseen. To surprise the public, he had to be surprised himself. More than once at the end of an instalment of one of his serial stories, he left his characters in an inextricable situation of which he himself did not know the outcome. Georges Sand frequently started a novel on the strength of a phrase, a thought, a page, a landscape. It was not she who guided her pen, but her pen which guided her. She started out with the intention of writing one volume, and she wrote ten. She might intend to write ten, and she wrote only one. She dreamed of a happy ending, and then she concluded with a suicide. But never have Scriba, or Dumas Père, or Dumas Fille, or Augier, or Labiche, or Sardou, written scene one, without knowing what they were going to put into the last scene. A point of departure was for them nothing but an interrogation point. Where are you going to lead me? they would ask it, and they would accept it only if it led them to a final point or to the central point which determined all the stages of the route including the first the novel is a journey in a carriage you make stops you spend a night at the inn you get out to look at the country you turn aside to take breakfast in some charming spot what difference does it make to you as a traveller you are in no hurry your object is not to arrive anywhere but to find amusement while on the road your true goal is the trip itself. A play is a railway journey by an express train, 40 miles an hour, and from time to time 10 minutes stop for the intermissions. And if the locomotive ceases rushing and hissing, you hiss. 
all this does not mean that there are no dramatic masterpieces which do not run so fast or that there was not an author of great talent moliere who often brought about his ending by the grace of god only let me add that to secure absolution for the last act of tartuffe you must have written the first four ernest Legouve. my dear fellow craftsman and friend you ask me how a play is written you honour me greatly but you also greatly embarrass me with study work patience memory energy a man can gain a reputation as a painter or a sculptor or a musician in those arts there are material and mechanical procedures that he can make his own thanks to ability and can attain to success the public to whom these works are submitted having none of the technical knowledge involved from the beginning regard the makers of these works as their superiors they feel that the artist can always reply to any criticism have you learned painting sculpture music no then don't talk so vainly you cannot judge you must be of the craft to understand the beauties and so on it is thus that the good-natured public is frequently imposed on in painting in sculpture in music by certain schools and celebrities it does not dare to protest but with regard to drama and comedy the situation is altered the public is an interested party to the proceedings and appears so to speak for the prosecution in the case the language that we use in our play is the language used by the spectators every day the sentiments that we depict are theirs the persons whom we set to acting are the spectators themselves in instantly recognized passions and familiar situations no preparatory studies are necessary no initiation in a studio or school is indispensable eyes to see ears to hear that's all they need the moment we depart i will not say from the truth but from what they think is truth they stop listening for in the theatre as in life of which the theatre is the reflection there are two kinds of truth first the absolute truth which always in the end prevails and secondly if not the false at least the superficial truth which consists of customs manners social conventions the uncompromising truth which revolts and the pliant truth which yields to human weakness in short the truth of alceste and that of philant it is only by making every kind of concession to the second that we can succeed in ending with the first the spectators like all sovereigns like kings nations and women do not like to be told the truth all the truth let me add quickly that they have an excuse which is that they do not know the truth they have rarely been told it they therefore wish to be flattered pitied consoled taken away from their preoccupations and their worries which are nearly all due to ignorance but which they consider the greatest and most unmerited to be found anywhere because their own this is not all by a curious optical effect the spectators always see themselves in the personages who are good tender generous heroic whom we place on the boards and in the personages who are vicious or ridiculous they never see any one but their neighbours how can you expect then that the truth we tell them can do them any good but i see that i am not answering your question at all you ask me to tell you how a play is made and i tell you or rather i try to tell you what must be put into it well my dear friend if you want me to be quite frank i'll own up that i don't know how to write a play one day a long time ago when i was scarcely out of school i asked my father the same question he answered it's very simple the first act clear 
the last act short and all the acts interesting the recipe is in reality very simple the only thing that is needed in addition is to know how to carry it out there the difficulty begins the man to whom this recipe is given is somewhat like the cat that has found a nut he turns it in every direction with his paw because he hears something moving in the shell but he can't open it in other words there are those whom from their birth know how to write a play i do not say that the gift is hereditary and there are those who do not know at once and these will never know you are a dramatist or you are not neither willpower nor work has anything to do with it the gift is indispensable i think that every one whom you may ask how to write a play will reply if he really can write one that he doesn't know how it is done it is a little as if you were to ask romeo what he did to fall in love with juliet and to make her love him he would reply that he did not know that it simply happened truly yours alexandra dumas feel end of selections from how to write a play edited by james brander matthews the dying gag by james l ford this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Burlinson. The Dying Gag From the Wit and Humor of America Volume 3 There was an affecting scene on the stage of a New York theater the other night, a scene invisible to the audience and not down on the bills, but one far more touching and pathetic than anything enacted before the footlights that night, although it was a minstrel company that gave the entertainment. It was a wild, blustering night, and the wind howled mournfully around the street corners, blinding the pedestrians with clouds of dust that it caught up from the gutters and hurled into their faces. Old man Sweeney, the stage doorkeeper, dozing in his little glazed box, was awakened by a sudden gust that banged the stage door and then went howling along the corridor, almost extinguishing the gas jets and making the minstrels shiver in their dressing rooms. What? You here tonight? exclaimed old man Sweeney as a frail figure, muffled up in a large ulster, staggered through the doorway and stood leaning against the wall, trying to catch his breath. Yes, I felt that I couldn't stay away from the footlights tonight. They tell me I'm old and worn out, and had better take a rest but I'll go on till I drop. And with a hollow cough, the old gag plodded slowly down the dim and draughty corridor and sank wearily on a sofa in the big dressing room, where the other gags and conundrums were awaiting their cues. Poor old fellow, said one of them sadly. He can't hold out much longer. He ought not to go on except at matinees, replied another veteran who was standing in front of the mirror, trimming his long silvery beard. And just then an attendant came in with several basins of gruel, and the old jests tucked napkins under their chins and sat down to partake of a little nourishment before going on. The bell tinkled and the entertainment began. One after another the jokes and conundrums heard their cues, went on, and returned to the dressing-room, for they all had to go on again in the afterpiece. 
The house was crowded to the dome, and there was scarcely a dry eye in the vast audience, as one after another of the old quips and jests that had been treasured household words in many a family came on and then disappeared to make room for others of their kind. As the evening wore on, the whisper ran through the theatre that the old gag was going on that night, perhaps for the last time and many an eye grew dim, many a pulse beat quicker at the thought of listening once more to that hoary jest, about whose head were clustered so many sacred memories. Meanwhile the old gag was sitting in his corner of the dressing-room, his head bowed on his breast, his gruel untasted on the tray before him. The other gags came and went, but he heeded them not. His thoughts were far away. He was dreaming of old days, of his early struggles for fame, and of his friends and companions of years ago. "'Where are they now?' he asked himself sadly. "'Some are wanderers on the face of the earth, in comic operas.' Two of them found ignoble graves in the tourists' company. Others are sleeping beneath the daisies in Harper's editor's drawer. You're called, sir. The old gag awoke from his reverie, started to his feet, and throwing aside his heavy ulster, staggered to the entrance and stood there patiently waiting for his cue. "'You're hardly strong enough to go on to-night,' said a merry jest, touching him kindly on the arm. But the grey-bearded one shook him off, saying hoarsely, "'Let be, let be. I must read those old lines once more. It may be for the last time.' And now a solemn hush fell upon the vast audience as a sad-faced minstrel uttered in tear-compelling accents the most pathetic words in all the literature of minstrelsy. "'And so you say, Mr. Johnson, that all the people on the ship were perishing of hunger, and yet you were eating fried eggs.' How do you account for that? For one moment a death-like silence prevailed. Then the old gag stepped forward and in clear, ringing tones replied, The ship lay too, and I got one. <sighs> A wild, heart-rending sob came from the audience and relieved the tension as the old gag staggered back into the entrance and fell into the friendly arms that were waiting to receive him. Sobbing conundrums bore him to a couch in the dressing-room. Weeping jokes strove in vain to bring back the spark of life to his inanimate form but all to no avail. The old gag was dead. End of the Dying Gag by James L. Ford Stage Costumes by Ned Wayburn This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Stage Costumes from The Art of Stage Dancing On the stage, as on the street, effective costuming is a matter of good taste. The dancer must be particular always to appear in a costume in keeping with the idea and character of the dance. The producer will be certain to adhere to this rule in all cases where the company supplies the stage costumes, as is customary. 
in vaudeville or in a home talent show where the dancer furnishes the outfit the same rule of fitness and appropriateness must be observed or the resulting incongruity will greatly mar the presentation have your stage costumes prepared with the idea of creating proper atmosphere for the dance you are giving or the scene in which the dance appears there are special designers of stage costumes in all the large cities here and abroad baxt the russian artist is a name all have come to know because of the bizarre effects he creates for the stage in london comelli was an outstanding name as costume designer for the drury lane productions erte in paris and there are many others abroad new york has several concerns of the first grade whose work along these lines is in evidence in the best theatres throughout the country and overseas the first step in costume making for the stage is made when the costume designer and the scenic artist are brought together under the producing director to arrange and settle upon a definite color scheme for each act and scene so that colors of costumes and stage settings shall be in full harmony throughout this is most important for the pictorial effects and is given careful study with the color schemes effectively planned there follows a further conference between producer and costume designer in which plot locale atmosphere characters lyrics music and everything else with a bearing on the dance or play in contemplation is fully gone over and considered the personality of the principals is given attention and the various possible effects of the ensemble or chorus groupings evolution and pictures are carefully planned with regard to lights and color effects the designer thus consulted submits pencil sketches of his ideas the next step is a watercolor design in the actual colors to be employed the accepted costume plate in color becomes now the working basis for the actual process of manufacturing the garments the cost of these color plates for each design is at least five dollars but usually more as high as twenty five dollars sometimes before a garment is cut or a stitch taken the price for a costume plate or design depending a good deal upon the standing or reputation of the designers materials as well as colors are given careful thought sometimes the artist's design is made around a sample of the actual materials though usually the color idea is developed first and the goods to be used in the garments considered later the quality of the material for stage costumes should be the very best to be had regardless of cost it is unquestionably true that the best is the cheapest in every way not only do costumes of cheap fabrics not hold together and the colors fade out when exposed to the strong modern stage lights and repairs and renewals become a frequent necessity but the very people on the stage who are compelled to wear the inferior costumes are literally let down to a lower level in morale as a consequence it is human nature for a well-groomed man or woman on the stage or off to be in better spirits and a better mental attitude for the very reason that they are correctly attired cheap garments and inferior costumes detract from the dancer's ability to do the best work however unconscious of this fact the dancer may be so i contend that it pays to use the best material and employ the best workmanship if only to keep the performers up to pitch and put the show over in a way that spells success then too there is the audience to be considered they know the difference between silk and cotton and are quick to judge the show by the appearance of the costumes that greet them on the stage it is little less than an insult to modern american audiences to expect them to pay modern prices for seats in the theatre and then parade a lot of second-rate costumes before them as your idea of something that will get by without detection or adverse comment the cost of costumes varies of course and the range is wide professional costumes worn in broadway productions under my direction have been made for as little as twenty three dollars and as high as one thousand fifteen hundred dollars for an individual costume chorus costumes have been shown on broadway 
costing fifty dollars to four hundred dollars for each girl in the ensemble however a satisfactory chorus costume can be produced today for around seventy five dollars and that for a principal about one hundred dollars there are large and satisfactory rental establishments in new york chicago philadelphia boston and others of our prominent cities where costumes can be rented for almost any character of show in single garments or for a complete production in the east among the best are brooks or eaves of new york and van horn of philadelphia in the wardrobe department of the ned wayburn studios there is carried a varied line of up-to-date costumes well over a hundred thousand dollars in actual cash value there is one set of twelve dancing costumes there alone worth four thousand eight hundred dollars or approximately four hundred dollars per costume any of my stock of costumes is available on a rental basis for amateur shows when my organization is employed to stage the productions and an expert wardrobe mistress goes along with the outfit to ensure proper adjustment and fitting of all the costumes to their wearers the complete costume when rented from any concern includes headdress bloomers and parasols if the character calls for them besides the gown or costume proper but never includes wigs shoes stockings or tights which must be purchased outright in our studio work and during the rehearsal period on the stage we recommend the ned wayburn rompers as a form of practice dress best suited for ladies use except in our foundation technique and acrobatic dancing classes in both of which the bathing suit is given the preference end of stage costumes by ned wayburn machine for noting down music from the history of inventions and discoveries by johann beckmann seventeen thirty nine to eighteen eleven this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org machine for noting down music from a history of inventions and discoveries as i have occasionally mentioned in the preceding article a machine for noting down any piece of music played on a harpsichord or any other musical instrument i shall here add a short story of the invention of it as far as i know and with the greater pleasure as another nation has laid claim to it though it belongs to my countrymen it appears incontestable that a proposal for inventing such a machine was first made known by an englishman in the month of march seventeen forty seven john freak transmitted to the royal society a paper written by a clergyman of the name of creed which was printed in the philosophical transactions under the following title a demonstration of the possibility of making a machine that shall write extempore voluntaries or other pieces of music as fast as any master shall be able to play them upon an organ harpsichord etc and that in a character more natural and intelligible and more expressive of all the varieties those instruments are capable of exhibiting than the character now in use the author of this paper however points out the possibility only of making such a machine without giving directions how to construct it in the year seventeen forty five john frederick unger then land bailiff and burgomaster in inbic and who is known by several learned folks fell upon the same invention without the smallest knowledge of the idea published in england this invention however owning to the variety of his occupations he did not make known till the year seventeen fifty two when he transmitted a short account of it accompanied with figures to the academy of sciences at berlin the academy highly approved of it and it was soon celebrated in several gazettes but a description of it was never printed 
a few days after euler had read this paper of mr unger's before the academy mr sutzer informed holfield of the invention and advised him to exert his ingenuity in constructing such a machine in two weeks this untaught mechanic without having read mr unger's paper and even without inspecting the figures completed the machine which mr unger himself had not been able to execute through the want of an artist capable of following his ideas unger's own description of his invention was printed with copper plates at brunswick in the year seventeen seventy four together with the correspondence between him and uller and other documents a description of whole fields machine illustrated with figures was published after his death by mr sutzer in the new memoirs of the academy of berlin under the title of description of a machine for noting down pieces of music as fast as they are played upon the harpsichord sutzer there remarks that holfield had not followed the plan sketched out by mr unger and that the two machines differed in this that ungers formed one piece with the harpsichord while that of holfield could be applied to any harpsichord whatever when dr burney visited berlin he was made acquainted with holfield's machine by mr marburg and has been so ungenerous or rather unjust as to say in his musical travels that it is an english invention and that it had been before fully described in the philosophical transactions this falsehood mr unger has sufficiently refuted without repeating his proofs i shall here content myself with quoting his own words in the following passage how can burney wish to deprive our ingenious holfield of the honour of being the sole author of this invention and to make an englishman share it with him because our german happened to execute successfully what his countryman creed only suggested such an attempt is as unjust in its consequences as it is dishonourable to the english nation and the english artists when we reflect on the high estimation in which music is held in england the liberality of the english nobility and their readiness to spare no expense in bringing forward any useful invention a property peculiar to the english it affords just matter of surprise that the english artists should have suffered themselves to be anticipated by a german journeyman lace-maker to our whole field therefore will incontestably remain the lasting honour of having executed a german invention and the germans may contentedly wait and see whether burney will find an english mechanic capable of constructing this machine from the information given by his countryman creed End of machine for noting down music from a history of inventions and discoveries by johann beckmann seventeen thirty nine to eighteen eleven published eighteen seventeen the local new york drama by lawrence hutton this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Betty B. Scene 5. The Local New York Drama. From Curiosities of the American Stage. Like Boys Unto a Mus. Antony and Cleopatra. Act 3. Scene 13. The number of plays based upon life in New York, all of which are strangely similar in title and in plot, or what must pass for plot, and all of which have been seen upon the New York stage since the first appearance of Mose, will surprise even those most familiar with our theatrical literature. Taken almost at random from various files of old playbills and from Mr. Ireland's records, there were A Glance at New York, or New York in 1848, New York as it is, First of May in New York, 
the mysteries and miseries of new york burton's new york directory the new york firemen fast young men of new york young new york the poor of new york new york by gaslight new york in slices the streets of new york the new york merchant and his clerks the ship carpenter of new york the seamstress of new york the new york printer the dry goods clerk of new york and many more including adele the new york sales lady which last was seen on the bowery side of the town as late as eighteen seventy nine these were nearly all spectacular plays and they were usually realistic to a degree in their representation of men and things in the lower walks of life rich merchants lovely daughters wealthy but designing villains comic waitermen and pert chambermaids with song and dance accompaniment were placed in impossible uptown parlors but the poor but honest printer set actual type from actual cases and cruelly wronged but humble maidens met disinterested detectives by real lamp posts and real ash barrels in front of what really looked like real saloons the original of all these local dramas was new york in eighteen forty eight or as it was called during its long run of twelve weeks at the olympic in that year a glance at new york it was a play of shreds and patches hurriedly and carelessly stitched together by mr baker the prompter of mitchell's famous little theatre in order to cover the nakedness of the program on the night of his own annual benefit it had no literary merit and no pretensions thereto and it would never have attracted public attention but for the wonderful bahoy of the period played by f s Shanfrau, one of those accidental but complete successes upon the stage which are never anticipated and which cannot always be explained he wore the soap locks of the period the plug hat with a narrow black band the red shirt the trousers turned up without which the genus was never seen and he had a peculiarly sardonic curve of the lip expressive of more impudence self-satisfaction suppressed profanity and general cussedness than delsart ever dared to put into any single facial gesture mr Shanfrau's mose hit the popular fancy at once and retained it until the volunteer fire department was disbanded and a glance at new york was followed by mose in california mose in a muss and even mose in china mr matthews in an article contributed to one of the magazines a few years ago records the fact that during one season mr Shanfrau played mose at two new york theatres and in one theatre in newark on the same night the mulligan guards the skidmores and their followers were the legitimate descendants of mose and they came in with the steam engines and the salaried firemen who took away the occupation and the opportunities of psychosy and jake harrigan and hart began their theatrical management at the theatre comique opposite the st nicholas hotel in eighteen seventy six and introduced what may be called the irish german negro american play illustrating phases of tenement house life in new york and amusing everybody who ever saw them from the babies on our block to muldoon himself the solid man mr harrigan wrote his own plays both he and mr hart were inimitable in their peculiar line as actors and they were wise and fortunate in their selection of their company which included mrs annie yeamans johnny wilde and other equally talented artists for whom dave brahm the leader of the orchestra wrote original and catching music which was sung and whistled and ground out from one end of the country to the other mr harrigan is a close observer and a born manager and his productions have been masterpieces in their way he puts living men and women upon the stage he has done for a certain phase of city life what denman thompson has done for life upon a farm and he is more to be envied than mr thompson because no class of theatre goers enjoy his productions more than do the living men and women whom his company with real art represent but alas his plays are not the great american plays 
for which the american dramatic critic is pining although like the old homestead and shenandoah and horizon and metamora and fashion they approach greatness if only in the fact that they have introduced and preserved a series of purely american types which are as great in their way as are the dramatic characters of other lands and greater and more enduring than many of the americans to be found in other branches of american literature end of the local new york drama by lawrence hutton intro to the colored american opera company by james m trotter for the coffee break collection entertainment this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Matt Perard. The Colored American Opera Company by James M. Trotter. Who, as they sang, would take the prison soul and lap it in Elysium? Milton. For wheresoe'er I turn my ravished eyes, gay gilded scenes and shining prospects rise poetic fields encompass me around and still i seem to tread on classic ground addison the opera or music drama in which in lieu of the ordinary forms of speech music and song are used to give elevated expression to thought is the most extensive and to nearly all lovers of melody the most charming of musical compositions in its construction several of the other forms of music are most pleasingly united in the opera with the language of poetry music is associated giving increased ornamentation and it is used also to bridge over so to speak the places where mere language either common or poetical could never pass that is to say there are some phases of feeling of such fineness and depth that only the soulful tones of music can call them into exercise or give them expression the requirements for operatic construction are of course very great so great that none may hope to succeed in the same save those endowed if not with genius at least with very superior talents they must possess both marked originality and power for continuity of thought in fact must form in their capabilities a very aerial a fountainhead of music from which must constantly flow melody after melody harmony after harmony ever new ever pleasing the whole presenting an artistically woven story of the vicissitudes of human life in the composition of an opera two persons are usually associated the one creating the words of the drama the song and the other composing its music in this field of musical creation men of great genius find a more varied a wider scope for the employment of their powers and but a few of the world's most eminent composers of music have failed to avail themselves of its opportunities for grand achievements success in it being generally considered as necessary for a rounding out of their inventive harmonic capacities while for the establishment of their titles to greatness they have sought to make some grand opera the chef d'oeuvre of their life work i would not imply however that all the great composers of opera worked simply for fame to assert that they did would no doubt be unjust as it would be denying that they possessed the sacred fire of genius and that deep and pure affection for art which judging from the noble beauty the grandeur of their works they must have possessed it does not seem allowable for instance to believe that beethoven created the charming and exalted beauties found in the opera of fidelio while inspired by no higher feelings than those which fill the breast of him who labors mainly for renown no we think of beethoven and of others like him as those who, while they were favored with extraordinary native powers, were also imbued with a pure love for music, a love of such strength that it formed a part of their very natures. To such minds and hearts, elevated artistic work 
was as natural as life itself in truth we might almost say was necessary to life but if great powers are required by the composer of an opera so also is it necessary that those who are to make known its meanings fully especially those who are to interpret its leading parts should possess as singers and actors more to say the least than ordinary abilities and those who in their capability for complete soulful sympathy with the author's aims who form in fine the very embodiment of the latter's ideals certainly deserve to stand next to him in greatness generally the brightest vocal stars have shed their effulgence upon the operatic stage here these singers have found the widest range for their extensive powers of voice and dramatic action the part of a performer in opera and here i refer not alone to one who acts the leading role is a most exacting one for the artist must unite in himself the qualities of both the singer and the actor while called upon to demonstrate with proper melody of voice and expression the meaning of the music of the opera he is also required to portray by suitable dramatic movements its corresponding meaning as found in the libretto these remarks apply more particularly to those who constitute the dramatis personae in operatic presentation of course we do not forget the very important aid afforded by those who are included in the pleasing chorus nor those who by instrumental accompaniment add to the charm of in fact give indispensable support to the whole performance it would perhaps be superfluous to here dwell at least more than incidentally upon the deep pleasure enjoyed by the lovers of music and of dramatic art when witnessing the performance of a good opera at such a time their truly musical souls enjoy a delicious a sumptuous feast of melody while the kaleidoscopic prospect formed by richly costumed actors and appropriate beautiful scenery fills them with delight the harsh realities of everyday life are so much relieved by the poetic charms of the ideal that they live amidst a scene of fairy-like enchantment nor does all that belongs to the bewitching occasion end with the regretted close of the performance for music when soft voices die vibrates in the memory and for days and days nay often throughout life do the best melodies the gems of the opera delightfully haunt the memory and awaken in the heart the most pleasing emotions in all this no more than a just tribute is paid to the noble genius of the composer and the fascinating power of his faithful coadjutor the lyric actor these few thoughts which it may be present nothing new to the student of the various forms of musical expression fall very short of doing justice to a subject of most delightful interest and one which for its proper treatment requires far more of elaboration than can here be given they are among such as come to me while reflecting upon an achievement that although not in a general way extraordinary was nevertheless in some important respects exceedingly remarkable and noteworthy i refer to a series of performances given at washington and philadelphia in the month of february eighteen seventy three by an organization called the colored american opera company this troupe formed in washington was composed of some of the most talented amateur musical people residing in that city the following named ladies and gentlemen were the principal members and performers mr john esbuca musical director mrs agnes gray smallwood soprano miss lena miller contralto miss mary a c coakley contralto mr henry f grant tenor mr richard tompkins tenor mr william t benjamin baritone mr george jackson baritone mr thomas h williams basso profundo mr henry donahoe acted as business manager around these the central figures were grouped a large well-balanced chorus and a fine orchestra nor was appropriate missing scene nor were any of the various accessories of a well-equipped opera wanting in the presentation the opera chosen for these 
performances was julius eichberg's excellent doctor of alcantara the first performances were given in lincoln hall washington on the evenings of february third and fourth eighteen seventy three the next at philadelphia in agricultural hall february twenty first twenty second and twenty third returning to washington the two last performances of the series were given in ford's theatre of the highly meritorious character of these presentations of opera there exists abundant evidence emanating from disinterested trustworthy sources from which i quote the following from the daily washington chronicle february four eighteen seventy three the american opera company the first colored opera troupe of any merit ever organized in this country appeared at lincoln hall last night in eichberg's opera the doctor of alcantara lincoln hall was literally packed of course the majority of the audience was colored and included a host of the personal friends of the singers glancing over the house the full opera dresses scattered liberally through the audience reminded one not a little of the scene at a concert by carlotti patti or the theodore thomas orchestra quite a third of the audience was composed of white ladies and gentlemen largely attracted perhaps by the novelty of the affair and among them were many representatives of the musical circles of the city somewhat curious to hear and compare the performance with those that they have been accustomed to hear the criticisms as a whole were favorable it was evident that the voices of two or three of the singers will be bettered by cultivation the choruses were effective in dramatic ability there was little lacking and the singers were quite as natural as many who appear in german and french opera from the daily national republican washington february fifth eighteen seventy three the second representation of the doctor of alcantara at lincoln hall last night was an improvement upon the first the natural nervousness of the singers was better overcome and they made a better use of their fine voices for the sake of making some just reflections and comparisons we select the name of miss lena miller who sang the role of isabella here is a young lady really pretty in form and features graceful in stage presence modest in manner and imbued with true affection and spirit for art at present she is not a great singer but her voice is sweet and clear and at times sympathetic in the simple statement high but judicious praise is included and here we might stop but miss miller's presence in opera has a significance and a promise infinitely pleasing to all candid and well-judging minds concerning the race to which she belongs neither miss miller nor miss smallwood nor any of the company have had the advantage of musical training in european or american conservatories they have to depend alone upon their natural gifts and personal acquirements this fact is one which makes vastly in their favor and protects them from the standard by which adeline patti or louise kellogg would be judged as artists under all the circumstances they sing and perform extraordinarily well and as for the chorus it is superior to that of any german or italian opera heard in the city for years mr benjamin's impersonation of dr paracelsus was really a good bit of acting and mr grant's carlos won for him deserved applause the role of don pomposa by mr williams the beso profundo was finely rendered his acting was good and his voice full of richest melody the opera last evening was largely patronized by distinguished people among them being senator and mrs sprague general holt and many others the experiment doubtful at first has proved a genuine success from the all-day city item philadelphia february twenty second eighteen seventy three the doctor of alcantara has at last attracted a number of colored amateurs of washington and they have lately appeared in that city with such success that they are induced to present it in philadelphia it must be remembered that this troupe is composed entirely of amateurs and is the first colored opera troupe in existence we have had the colored mario thomas j bowers the black swan 
miss greenfield etc but never until now have we had a complete organization trained for ensembles the audience attracted to horticultural hall last evening was therefore prepared to make all sorts of allowances for the shortcomings of the amateurs but it was hardly necessary as the troupe really excellent well trained possesses agreeable voices sings intelligently and with experience will we are confident attract a great deal of attention and receive high praise end of intro to the colored opera company by james m trotter what is a photoplay by j berg essenwine and arthur leeds this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by andrea k what is a photoplay from writing the photoplay as its title indicates this book aims to teach the theory and practice of photoplay construction this we shall attempt by first pointing out its component parts and then showing how these parts are both constructed and assembled so as to form a strong well-built attractive and saleable manuscript the photoplay defined and differentiated a photoplay is a story told largely in pantomime by players whose words are suggested by their actions assisted by certain descriptive words thrown on the screen and the whole produced by a moving picture machine it should be no more necessary to say that not all moving picture productions are photoplays than that not all prose is fiction yet the distinction must be emphasized a photoplay is to the program of a moving picture theater just what a short story is to the contents of a popular magazine it supplies the storytelling or drama element a few years ago the managers of certain theaters used so to arrange their programs that for four or five days out of every week the pictures they showed would consist entirely of photoplays on such days their programs corresponded exactly to the contents page of an all-fiction magazine being made up solely to provide entertainment the all-fiction magazine contains no essays critical papers or special articles for the instruction of the reader beyond the information and instruction conveyed to him while interestedly perusing the stories just so the all photoplay program in a picture theater at the time of which we speak was one made up entirely of either dramatic or comedy subjects films classified as scenic educational vocational industrial sporting and topical were not included in such a program true a genuine photoplay may contain scenes and incidents which would almost seem to justify its being included in one of the foregoing classes one might ask for instance why selig's film on the trail of the germs produced about five years ago was classified as educational while edison's the red cross seal and the awakening of john bond both of which were produced at the instance of the national association for the study and prevention of tuberculosis and had to do with the fight waged by that society against the disease in the cities were listed as dramatic films or photoplays anyone who saw all three of the films however would recognize that the selig picture while in every respect a subject of great human interest, was strictly educational and employed the thread of a story not as a dramatic entertainment, but merely to furnish a connecting link for the scenes which illustrated the methods of curing the disease after a patient is discovered to be infected. The Edison pictures, on the other hand, were real dramas with well-constructed plots and abundant dramatic interest, even while, as the advertising in the trade papers announced, the principal object of the pictures was to disseminate information as to what becomes of the money that is received from the sale of Red Cross stamps at holiday time. 
so we see that the distinction lies in the amount of plot or story thread which each carries, and that a mere series of connected pictures without a plot running through it obviously cannot be called a photoplay any more than a series of tableaus on the stage could be accurately called a play. Therefore, learn to think of a photoplay as being a story prepared for pantomimic development before the camera, a story told in action with inserted descriptive matter where the thought might be obscure without its help a story told in one or more reels each reel containing from twenty-five to fifty scenes the spectator at a photoplay entertainment must be able promptly and easily to discover who your characters are what kind of people they are what they plan to do how they succeed or fail and, in fact, must get the whole story entirely from what he sees the actors in the picture do, with the slight assistance of a few explanatory leaders or subtitles, and, perhaps, such inserts as a letter, a newspaper cutting, a telegram, or some such device flashed for a moment on the screen. The more perfect the photoplay, the less the need for all such explanatory material, as is the case in perfect pantomime. This, of course, is not to insist upon the utter absence of all written and printed material thrown on the screen, a question which will be discussed in a later chapter. It is enough now to emphasize this important point. Dialogue and description are for the fiction writer. The photoplaywright depends upon his ability to think and write in action, for the postures, grouping, gestures, movements, and facial expressions of the characters must be shown in action, and not described as in prose fiction. Action is the most important word in the vocabulary of the photoplaywright. To be able to see in fancy his thoughts transformed into action is to have gained one goal for which every photoplay writer strives. End of What is a Photoplay by J. Berg Essenwine and Arthur Leeds The Development of Screen Acting as an Art by Inez and Helen Klumpf This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Andrea K. The Development of Screen Acting as an Art. From Screen Acting, Its Requirements and Rewards. It is not necessary to travel back very far along the road which the motion picture industry has traveled to reach the days when exaggerated pantomime was what was meant by acting in pictures. We can all remember how, when an actor wanted to tell someone that he was going away, he would point to himself, then to the door, then back to himself again. He made faces, gesticulated profusely, left nothing to the intelligence of the audience. The development of screen acting has depended, to a great extent, on the growth and improvement of audiences, just as the development of sets and lighting and photography have also been the result of a desire on the part of the public to see better things on the screen. To experiment with motion pictures is an expensive thing, but from time to time we have had producers who dare do it, who, like D.W. Griffith, dared attempt something as big as the birth of a nation, the failure of which would mean a tremendous financial loss. Yet experiments there have been. William S. Hart was one of the first to make them. He staked his whole motion picture career on an experiment. He had been on the stage for some sixteen years, and decided to go into pictures because he felt that the West— which he loved, was being caricatured on the screen. He wanted to show the public what a real cowboy was. And so he went into pictures, directing as well as acting. His first picture was made for Triangle. When the authorities saw it, they protested violently. You don't act enough, they told him. The public won't stand for your doing so little acting. You do too much just by changing your expression. You don't exaggerate enough. Hart insisted that his theory was right, 
that on the screen an actor is much nearer his audience than he is on the stage, and that therefore gesticulation and grimacing are foolish. He felt that natural work, which conveyed the right meaning to the audience, was all that was necessary. The Triangle people were not convinced, and sold the picture to another releasing organization. It was a big success, and Hart was vindicated. He was one of the first, if not the first, to prove that screen acting should be natural, and not a series of exaggerated movements. He has progressed with the development of this movement toward natural work on the screen. His work today is more subtle, more effective than it was then. He has seen that audiences were reaching the point where that was what they wanted, and has always been just a little bit ahead of their desire in this respect. The fact that the public won't let him retire is proof of his wisdom as well as of his talent. Acting on the screen is not acting, it is being. It is getting into a character, fitting it as a hand fits into a glove, and then letting the public see what that character does under a given set of circumstances. When D. W. Griffith began working with the talented and experienced Joseph Shieldkraut, who is the hero in Orphans of the Storm, he saw that the young man, governed by his training in pantomime, was doing too much and not being enough. Don't do so much, just be still, he told Shieldkraut, and by way of making his point clear, he had broken blossoms run off in the projection room and told Shieldkraut to study Dick Barthelmess's work in it. When it was over, Shieldkraut asked to have it run again, and then he came to Mr. Griffith. I see my mistake, he said. You will remember the remarkable restraint with which Barthelmess played that role how few motions he would make, even in a big scene, and how very effective they were. That was because he is an accomplished actor. He has developed in the new school of screen acting and is a master of it. He dares to be still, merely to be what he is supposed to be, and let the audience accept him in that capacity. And so screen acting has become an art in itself. It is not pantomime, it is not acting as we understand the word from what we see on the stage. It comes nearer to being a projection of the trained imagination, as progressive a thing as a strain of music, with the incidence of the story, the instrument on which it is performed. In giving this definition, I refer, of course, to the work of the great artists of the screen, to Lillian Gish's performance in certain parts of Way Down East, to some of Pauline Frederick's portrayals, to bits given us by Norma Talmadge, Charles Ray, Charlie Chaplin, Colleen Moore, John Barrymore, Richard Barthelmess, Bert Lytell, by Betty Compson in The Miracle Man. In fact, by everyone whom you have seen in a true portrayal of a bit of life. This development in the art of screen acting is due largely to the fact that acting before the motion picture camera has become subjective rather than objective. Actors used to move their hands and arms and make faces to portray an emotion. Now the portrayal begins in their mind. They are conscious of it there. They concentrate on its mental portrayal, and the human body naturally conveys that mental conception to the audience. Colleen Moore says, Gestures, expressions, etc., I think come more or less instinctively, as one gets into a part and ceases to be oneself, and becomes for the time at least the character one is portraying. By imagining the things that a certain type of girl would think and do, the obvious acting comes as a result. I never plan my gestures or the expression of my face. I only try to get the feeling and atmosphere surrounding the girl, and then to think and feel as the girl herself would think and feel. Of course, screen acting could not have developed as it has if the audiences in the motion picture theaters had not developed also in responsiveness, and the two must continue to progress together. Nowadays, a skilled actor can depend on a single movement of the eyes to convey an important point. That is because his audience is educated in going to motion pictures and can catch such an indication of emotion, where formerly it would have demanded movements of the arms and a change in the expression of the whole face as well. 
and as this responsiveness continues to develop, we may expect finer and finer work on the screen. End of The Development of Screen Acting as an Art by Inez and Helen Klumpf Getting into a Picture Company by the Inquiry Editor This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Andrea K. Getting into a Picture Company From the Motion Picture Story Magazine, February 1912 How can I get into a moving picture company? That's a letter the Motion Picture Story Magazine gets in every mail. If there is no such letter, we send the carrier back to the post office to get it, because we know there must be one there, and there most always is. In the answers to inquiries, we have replied to this question every month. But space there is limited, and this is written as a general reply to literally hundreds of inquiries. And the answer is, it cannot be done. There was a time, and it is not so very long ago, that the established actors looked with horror on the disgrace of working for the moving picture makers. Even then some level-headed and far-seeing players of real repute, such as Charles Kent of the Vitagraph, then one of the leaders of the dramatic stage, realized the possibilities of the business and quit the stage for the studio, disregarding the pitying comments of their fellows, and working to the end that even now has not yet fully come, but most players shun the pictures. There had to be some players to people the mimic stage, and eight or ten years ago each of the few picture companies maintained a sort of studio school. Novices who gave promise were coached, experience brought finish, and with increasing skill came a standard of merit that attracted better material. Now and then some actor, desperately destitute, would take up the work as a makeshift, concealing the fact from his fellows. But the work was uncertain and paid for only when performed. Dark days were dark indeed for the player who needed the money, for he got three or five dollars a day when he worked, and nothing when he didn't. It is less than five years ago that the first stock company was formed. The Vitagraph found that it was training clever people, only to lose them when some dramatic engagement offered a regular salary, and some of the best were told that they would be paid for six days a week, whether they worked or not. Other companies followed suit, and now players are divided into stock and jobbers, the latter working only when they are needed and being paid only when they work. Few dramatic companies stay on the road for the 40 weeks that once formed the theatrical season. Now 30 weeks is a long season, and a 20-week tour is not unusual. The engagement is prefaced by from two to six weeks of rehearsal without pay. There are heavy expenses for hotel tips, sleepers, and the hundred details of the road, all of which are escaped in the studio, while on the other hand the smaller salary is paid 52 weeks a year. It was only natural that the players should turn to this new departure, and instead of the companies having to urge players to act, they suddenly found themselves overrun with applications for positions. The boot was on the other foot with a vengeance. Not all players are found available for picture work. They must have a good photographic face, regular features, good eyes, a pleasing mouth, and mobility of expression. There is a little line running from the base of the nostrils to the corners of the mouth that has kept scores of clever women off the photoplay stage because it ages the face. Then, too, there are matters of stage technique that unfit some of the most experienced players. For example, the size of the stage. The dramatic actor is taught to move about the 40-foot set as though it were a 20-foot room. He acquires a largeness of gesture, a length of stride that handicaps him when he comes to the small photographic stage that is even smaller than the 12 to 18 foot box sets of the studio. The photographic stage is only about 8 feet wide and perhaps 6 deep, and some veteran players find it impossible not to fall out of the picture. 
Still, many acquire the tricks of the photoplay, and their stage experience is put to good use. They know how to act, they have the quickness of perception that enables them to catch the director's ideas from a word or two, and they bring to their work the finished art of the trained actor. Naturally, these are preferred to the untrained novice. In the first four months of the current theatrical season, more dramatic companies came to grief than in any similar period in the history of the drama. As this is written in late December, there are probably 7,000 players out of employment, and many of them are in sore financial straits. One company recently declared that had it not been for the uselessness of the proceeding, the names of more than 4,000 applicants could have been registered on the waiting list. The director for another company told of a well-known comedian who fairly pleaded for a chance to earn $18 a week in the studio, though his stage salary is never less than $100 a week, and at times has been better than $150 but he cannot pay his board bills with what he used to get. A stock star, whose salary ranges from $75 to $125 a week, would be glad to do jobbing at $5 a day, in the hope of paying her expenses. The average company employs from 30 to 50 players on salary. This means that from 1,200 to 2,000 players are employed, not counting the cowboy riders in the Western pictures. Most companies try to hold their practice players so that few changes are made. And, to supply these changes and the new demand, there is a surplus of some 2,000 fully experienced dramatic players available who require only the slight coaching that will familiarize them with studio work. Under these circumstances, it will be very plain that the little girl from Florida or the stage-struck boy from Maine stands a very small chance of getting into a company when an advertisement in the daily papers will bring hundreds of extra people for mob scenes and postal cards will bring experienced players glad to work for as little as the beginner and who do not require the months of training that are needed to fit the novice for the work. With a reserve of 2,000, why should any company consider for an instant the extended education of the little girl who knows she can act better than Miss Florence Lawrence if only she is given a chance? Perhaps she can, but the chances are that she cannot. She will start with minor roles, but even if she plays only the maid, she must play it well and with a due regard for the requirements of the picture stage. In dramatic work, the beginner who comes on and falters out that the carriage waits does not seriously affect the performance, but in pictures, all the playing must be natural. More than this, the beginner may, by some variation from the stage directions, spoil a scene running from 50 to 100 feet and make it necessary to take the entire picture over again. And this may happen not once, but a dozen of times each with its penalty of spoiled film, delay in playing, and the discomfiture of the older players that will have its effect on the screened picture. There was a time when the picture makers were glad to have anyone come and learn who would pose in the pictures. But that day has passed, and now experience on the professional stage or in some other picture company is absolutely essential. Experience in amateur work or a dramatic school is worse than useless. The director wants players who have had actual experience in playing parts. The other day, a correspondent was advised that the only way to get into a photoplay studio was to go up in an airship and fall through the skylight, and that seems to be the only way for a beginner. Playing in photoplay is not as easy as it looks. Apart from the studying of lines and the monotony of their repetition, it is harder work than dramatic acting. Perhaps once in a thousand times some star might be developed from the amateur applicants, but she or he will not be good enough to make it worthwhile bothering with the other 999. This article is not written merely to discourage the photoplay aspirant and head off the letters referred to in the opening paragraphs, but to explain why it is utterly useless to try and get with a picture company in the hope that you will be spared the labor of writing applications, the expense of postage, 
and the nerve-wearing waiting and hoping. It is not a snap judgment, but the result of careful study and an intimate knowledge of inside studio affairs. End of Getting Into a Picture Company by The Inquiry Editor The Rehearsal of a Play by Franklin Files. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Rehearsal of a Play. Few who see a new play well performed have any idea of the careful preparation given it. The hardest work done by actors is at rehearsals. These last about four weeks for a piece that is to be finally brought out. The first thing done is to call the company together to hear the piece read. The actors may have known little about it, except the portions contained in their separate roles. By courtesy, the author is asked to be the reader, but he usually declines in favor of the stage director. This meeting is held in any handy room, in a theater, or elsewhere. The director makes use of his best elocution so that the actors may catch the spirit and full meaning of the scenes as they sit before him like any other audience. Each pays a special heed to the passages in which he is to figure. He is anxious about the relations which he is to bear to the others, and he may also be jealous about his comparative importance. The reading includes all the directions as well as the dialogue, and occupies about two hours for the same time that a performance of the same play will take, aside from the intermissions between acts. After the reading is over, each actor receives a typewritten copy of his part. The whole play is not given to him. Then the director announces the time and place of the first rehearsal, which is usually held the next morning on a stage. But in the autumn, when numerous companies are being drilled in New York, small halls have to be used instead. The players come in everyday street attire, and if the place is none too well warmed, they keep their overcoats, wraps, and hats on. If it is in a theater, the stage is nearly bare of scenery, and it is dimly lighted by a bad blend of bunched gas jets and obscure windows. If it is in a hall, the light is better, but the barrenness is worse. The stage is represented by a chalk-lined space on the floor. The things that will by and by give illusion and glamour are not so much as suggested. The reality of a first rehearsal is in the widest kind of contrast with the performance which it is intended to lead to. The entirely utilitarian aspect of rehearsing is not made less by the fact that the actors receive no pay for it. If they are not at the same time getting salaries for acting in a current piece, they are without income during the practice on the new one. This is an invariable custom. On the first morning, the opening act only is taken up. The players have not yet been required to memorize their parts. They are to learn the action first. They go through with the positions and movements as written down by the author, and explained by the director. Doors and windows are indicated by chairs. Balconies, stairways, fences, gates, sloping banks, winding paths, floral bowers, all are located by makeshifts. The aim is to familiarize the actors at the outset with the arrangement of the scene as it is to be. At the same time, their movements with reference to one another are learned slowly and carefully. While they are doing this, they read the words without much attempt at expression. On the same afternoon, the second act may be gone through with. At the end of the day's work, which does not in the early stages include the evening, the director says, Ten o'clock tomorrow morning, first act rough perfect, without parts. He means that the actors are expected to learn their parts in that portion of the play, so as to recite them without reference to the copy. The next rehearsal begins with their attempt to do this. Some are able to, while others fail and have to keep their manuscript in hand. On the third day they will be reprimanded, if still unprepared with the first act. 
all may then be told to study the second act for the ensuing day, when the third act may be taken up. Thus the actors are made to work their way along through the play. By the end of a week they have learned both the language and action more or less completely. They are much like pupils in a school. Some are quick and deciduous. Others are slow and inattentive. Some do their very best, and some do not. The brainy actor, who is careless, may be harder to get along with than the dullard who takes pains. While a liberal education is very helpful, first-rate work is done without it by persons born with a gift for acting. These are comic actors, as a rule, in whom nicety is less essential than mirth. Still, a certain player of dignified old gentlemen knows no grammar by precept or practice. His ever-correct language on the stage comes of word-by-word -word adherence to the text. He is even right in the use of his pronouns. It is not always easy to keep the cultured actor from saying me when he should say I. Each part in a play is copied out for the actor assigned to it. In addition to the language to be spoken by him, it contains the cues, that is to say, every separate speech, long or short, is preceded by several concluding words from the next prior speech of some other person. That gives him the cue to begin. He must memorize these scraps of sentences quite as thoroughly as the matter that he is to utter, in order that his responses shall be ready. He must be particular about the ends of his own speeches, too, because they are in turn the cues for his companions. Lapses at these points cause confusion. The rehearsals have not gone far, before the director gives notice that all must be letter-perfect. What he means is that now the actors must recite their entire parts correctly in every word. Some are able to do that without difficulty. Others are surprisingly slow, even when they try hard. As the matter is broken up in dialogue, in which questions and answers are reminders of each other, the study is not often one that would be thought hard by a bright schoolboy. Still, there are actors otherwise clever who bother the director by mumbling and jumbling long after others are letter-perfect. If reproof and prompting do not mend the fault, rehearsal for lines is called. Then the company sits before the director in a semicircle and recites the entire play without action. The smallest deviation from the text is corrected. Before the second week is over, the players have learned to say and do everything that has been set down for them by the author. Here and there, an actor is fully prepared at this juncture to play his part in public. But it is not so with the majority. The women are more advanced than the men, as a rule partly from having applied themselves more faithfully, and partly from the sex's natural aptness. The director now devotes all his efforts to bringing forward the laggards, teaching the inexpert, and perfecting the proficient. It must not be inferred that talent is repressed at rehearsals. It is merely guided. Strong individuality is not objected to, if only it is adaptable. The keynote in modern acting is naturalness. Human beings in plays are now required to speak as human beings do in real life under like circumstances. The hardest work of the director remains to be done. It is that of making the actors carry out the author's intention fully. They cannot be left to themselves. Each would play his part with small regard for the general effect. Some of them have creative ability, and the director is glad to hear what they have to say, because their suggestions are often valuable. Many a role that was small as written has become big when acted. But the majority of the actors are mere puppets in the hands of the man who conducts the rehearsals. His word is their law. He tells them how their parts shall be played. This extends to the pronunciation of the smallest word, and the making of the faintest 
gesture. Nothing whatever is left unfixed before the public performance. It is only by a method of positive control that the whole purpose of a play can be carried out. It would be defeated if the actors were at all free to do as they thought fit. Some are tractable. Some are willful. All must obey or quit. So the stage director is an autocrat, and he may be a tyrant. He is a master of stagecraft, and he may be a dramatic scholar. Above all else, he needs the theatric instinct. When he sees or hears a thing, he should know intuitively, as well as by rule and precedent, whether it will convey its meaning to an audience. He may be a gentleman or a boor. In most cases, he is a gentleman. He deals with men and women of culture in the main, and, though firm, he is polite and good-tempered. It is the duty of the director to preserve the proper balance of all the play's various interests. He may blurt out his orders and reproofs without caring if they wound anyone's feelings, or he may call individuals aside for private correction. But in any case he enforces his views and commands obedience. The reason that outsiders are but rarely admitted to rehearsals is therefore obvious. Rehearsals are funny in some ways. The dead-in earnest director himself is comic at times. That is so when he shows an actress how to speak and behave in a sentimental scene. A hulk of a man posing as a gentle maiden and breathing vows of constancy to her lover is a ridiculous sight but his illustration is clear enough. He might not be able to play even a minor male role cleverly, but he has to have the knack of teaching others. He has a schoolmaster's troubles, too. One of them is to keep the actors quiet when they are not in the scene. They are prone to chatter in groups. Points of difficulty arise constantly for the director to settle. They usually come from the actor's common desire to be made the most of. The two who impersonate the lovers in the play are especially given to disagreement. Each is afraid of being put back or aside in favor of the other. The center of the stage is the place of vantage in their minds, and they do like to hold it. In passing each other, which shall do so on the side towards the audience? When one must turn away from the people, which shall thus hide the face? Each is in dread lest the other gain an advantage in one way or another. When such a thing cannot be helped owing to the author's directions, they do not hesitate to ask that changes be made. The comedians are all this time striving for chances for their fun, and would obtrude it into the serious scenes too much if they could. The utmost pains are taken with scenes in which two persons have anything to do with each other. If they shake hands, it must be done at just the right instant, and with no uncertainty. A blow is practiced till it looks just right, and is never afterwards struck differently. Embraces and kisses are rehearsed with the extremest care. They must have an impulsive manner. They must look sufficiently fervid. It is a curious sight, that of two players who are to express the ardent love which Shakespeare has written for his Romeo and Juliet, but who at rehearsal, in modern clothes, and no accessories of glamour, practice a kiss as mechanically and unfeelingly as though it were, as it is, then, utterly devoid of sentiment. There must be no hesitation nor clumsiness. Romeo is not permitted to decide whether to throw both arms around his sweetheart, or only one, or which, nor may Juliet be shy or forward, yielding or resisting as she chooses. The director will place their arms for them if they do not themselves make a picturesque exhibit of tenderness. And the kiss? Shall it be delivered by the wooer on the lips of the one, or on brow, or cheek? That question is considered and settled. Are kisses on the stage genuine? Well, not at rehearsals, except, maybe, once or twice, in order to show the effect fully, 
an actress would resent a real kiss at a rehearsal except when necessary for the satisfaction of natural curiosity on that point it may be told right here that most of the kisses in the public performances of plays are actual kisses end of the rehearsal of a play by franklin files of stage dancing by heinrich cornelius agrippa von Nettleshine, 1486 to 1535. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Of Stage Dancing Stage dancing was designed for imitation and demonstration, whereby to explain things conceived in the mind by the gestures of the body, so clearly and perspicuously representing manners and affections, that the spectator shall understand the player by the motion of his body, though he say not a word. So far the excellency of this art appears that, without the help of an interpreter, while the actions by motion represent an old man, a young man, a woman, a servant, a drunkard, an angry person, or of any other condition or affection whatsoever, the spectator at a distance hearing nothing of the story shall be able to understand the subject of the play. This brought stage players into great request, as Macrobius witnesseth, so that Cicero was wont to contend with Roscius, who was also very intimate with Scylla the dictator, who should plainest and soonest, and with most variety, express the same sentence, whether the one by gesticulation or the other in set language, which encouraged Roscius to write a treatise wherein he compares stage motion or action with eloquence, but the mass alliances great preservers of serious gravity would not endure the stage player among them for that most of their arguments consisting in the repetition of rapes and adulteries they thought the often feeling thereof would accustom men to the practice of such things in fine it is not only a dishonest and wicked calling to exercise stage playing but also a matter of great dishonor to behold them for the pleasure of lascivious minds often degenerates into wickedness so that of old there was no name so ignominious as that of a stage player who by the laws was made incapable of all honour and honourable society End of, of stage dancing by heinrich cornelius agrippa von nettleshine fourteen eighty six to fifteen thirty five Shadows of the Stage by William Winter. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 26 Mrs. G. H. Gilbert. Students of the English stage find in books on that subject abundant information about the tragedy queens of the early drama and much likewise though naturally somewhat less because comedy is more difficult to discuss than tragedy about the comedy queens mrs sibber still discomforts the melting mrs porter by a tenderness even greater than the best of Velvederus could dispense mrs bracegirdle and mrs oldfield still stand confronted on the historic page and still their battle continues year after year all readers know the sleepy voice and horrid sigh of mrs pritchard in lady macbeth's awful scene of haunted somnambulism the unexampled and unexcelled grandeur of mrs yates in medea the infinite pathos of mrs dancer she that became in succession mrs spranger berry and mrs crawford and her memorable scream as lady randolph at was he alive the comparative discomfiture of both those ladies by mrs siddons with her wonderful wailing cry as isabella o oh my byron my byron her overwhelming lady macbeth and her imperial queen catherine the brilliant story of peg woofington and the sad fate of mrs robinson the triumphant career of mrs abington 
in the melancholy collapse of mrs jordan all those things and many more are duly set down in the chronicles but the books are comparatively silent about the old women of the stage an artistic line no less delightful than useful of which mrs g h gilbert is a sterling and brilliant representative mrs jefferson the great-grandmother of the comedian joseph jefferson who died of laughter on the stage seventeen sixty six to seventeen sixty eight might fitly be mentioned as the dramatic ancestor of such actresses as mrs gilbert she was a woman of great loveliness of character and of great talent for the portrayal of old women and likewise of certain old men in comedy she had says tate wilkinson one of the best dispositions that ever harbored in a human breast and he adds that she was one of the most elegant women ever beheld mrs gilbert had always suggested that image of grace goodness and piquant ability mrs vernon was the best in this line until mrs gilbert came and the period which has seen mrs judah mrs vincent mrs german mary carr mrs chippendale mrs sterling mrs billington mrs drew mrs phillips and madame ponisi has seen no superior to mrs gilbert in her special walk she was in youth a beautiful dancer and all her motions have spontaneous ease and grace she can assume the fine lady without for an instant suggesting the parvenu she is equally good whether as the formal and severe matron of starch domestic life or the genial dame of the pantry she could play temperance in the country squire and equally she could play mrs jellyby all varieties of the eccentricity of elderly women whether serious or comic are easily within her grasp betsy trotwood embodied by her becomes a living reality while on the other hand she suffused with a sinister horror her stealthy gliding uncanny personation of the dumb half insane hester dethridge that was the first great success that mrs gilbert gained under augustin daly's management she has been associated with daly's company since his opening night as a manager august sixteenth eighteen sixty nine when at the fifth avenue theatre then in twenty fourth street she took part in robertson's comedy of play the first time i ever saw her she was acting the marquise de st maur in cast on the night of its first production in america august fifth eighteen sixty seven at the broadway theatre the house near the southwest corner of broadway and broom street that had been wallach's but now was managed by barney williams the assumption of that character perfect in every particular was instinct with pure aristocracy but while brilliant with serious ability it gave not the least hint of those rich resources of humor that since have diffused so much innocent pleasure most of her successes have been gained as the formidable lady who typifies in comedy the domestic proprieties and the nemesis of respectability it was her refined and severely correct demeanor that gave soul and wings to the wild fun of a night off from miss garth to mrs laburnum is a far stretch of imitative talent for the interpretation of the woman nature that everybody from shakespeare down has found it so difficult to treat this actress has never failed to impress the spectator by her clear-cut brilliant identification with every type of character that she has assumed and back of this she has denoted a kind heart and a sweet and gentle yet never insipid temperament the condition of goodness sympathy graciousness and cheer that is the flower of a fine nature and a good life scenes in which mrs gilbert and charles fisher or james lewis have participated as old married people on daily stage will long be remembered for their intrinsic beauty suggestive of the touching lines and when with envy time transported shall think to rob us of our joys you'll in your girls again be courted and i'll go wooing with my boys End of chapter twenty six mrs g h gilbert shadows of the stage by william winter
the children of the stage by robert g ingersoll this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org read by michelle fry baton ridge louisiana in december 2016 the children of the stage published in the world new york march twenty fourth eighteen ninety nine from a speech given in new york on march twenty third eighteen ninety nine forward colonel robert g ingersoll was a special star among stars at the benefit given yesterday afternoon at the fifth avenue theater for the actors fund there were a great many other stars and a very long program the consequence was that the performance began before one o'clock and was not over until almost dinner-time usually in such cases the least important performers are placed at the beginning and the audience straggles in leisurely without worrying a great deal over what it has missed yesterday however it had been announced in advance that colonel ingersoll would start the ball a-rolling and the result was that before the overture was finished the house was packed to the doors Colonel Ingersoll's contribution was a short address delivered in his characteristic style of florid eloquence. The World, New York, March 24, 1899. Disguise it as we may, we live in a frightful world, with evils, with enemies on every side. From the hedges along the path of life leap the bandits that murder and destroy, and every human being, no matter how often he escapes, at last will fall beneath the assassin's knife. To change the figure, we are all passengers on the train of life. The tickets give the names of the stations where we boarded the car, but the destination is unknown. At every station some passengers, pallid, breathless, dead, are put away, and some, with the light of morning in their eyes, get on. To change the figure again, on the wide sea of life we are all on ships or rafts or spars, and some by friendly winds are borne to the fortunate isles, and some by storms are wrecked on the cruel rocks. And yet upon the isles, the same as upon the rocks, death waits for all. And death alone can truly say, all things come to him who waits. And yet, strangely enough, there is in this world of misery, of misfortune, and of death, the blessed spirit of mirth. The travellers on the path, on the train, on the ships, the rafts, and spars, sometimes forget their perils and their doom. All blessings on the man whose face was first illuminated by a smile. All blessings on the man who first gave to the common air the music of laughter, the music that for the moment drove fears from the heart, tears from the eyes, and dimpled cheeks with joy. All blessings on the man who sowed with merry hands the seeds of humor, and at the lipless skull of death snapped the restless fingers of disdain. Laughter is the blessed boundary line between the brute and man. Who are the friends of the human race? They who hide with vine and flower the cruel rocks of fate. The children of genius, the sons and daughters of mirth and laughter, of imagination, those whose thoughts, like moths with painted wings, fill the heaven of the mind. Among these sons and daughters are the children of the stage, the citizens of the mimic world, the world enriched by all the wealth of genius, enriched by painter, orator, composer, and poet, the world of which Shakespeare, the greatest of human beings, is still the unchallenged emperor. These children of the stage have delighted the weary travelers on the thorny path, amused the passengers on the fated train, and filled with joy the hearts of the clingers to spars and the floaters on rafts. These children of the stage, with fancy wand, rebuilt the past. The dead are brought to life and made to act again the parts they played. The hearts and lips that long ago were dust are made to beat and speak again. The dead kings are crowned once more, and from the shadows of the past emerged the queens, jeweled and sceptred as of yore. 
lovers leave their graves and breathe again their burning vows and again the white breasts rise and fall in passion storm the laughter that died away beneath the touch of death is heard again and lips that fell to ashes long ago are curved once more with mirth again the hero bears his breast to death again the patriot falls and again the scaffold stained with noble blood becomes a shrine the citizens of the real world gain joy and comfort from the stage the broker the speculator ruined by rumor the lawyer baffled by the intelligence of a jury or the stupidity of a judge the doctor who lost his patience because he lost his patience the merchant in the dark days of depression and all the children of misfortune the victims of hope deferred forget their troubles for a little while when looking on the mimic world when the shaft of wit flies like the arrow of ulysses through all the rings and strikes the centre when words of wisdom mingle with the clown's conceits when folly laughing shows her pearls and mirth holds carnival when the villain fails and the right triumphs the trials and the griefs of life for the moment fade away and so the maiden longing to be loved the young man waiting for the yes deferred the unloved wife hear the old old story told again and again within their hearts is the ecstasy of requited love the stage brings solace to the wounded peace to the troubled and with the wizard's wand touches the tears of grief and they are changed to the smiles of joy the stage has ever been the altar the pulpit the cathedral of the heart there the enslaved and the oppressed the erring the fallen even the outcast find sympathy and pity gives them all her tears and there in spite of wealth and power in spite of caste and cruel pride true love has ever triumphed over all the stage has taught the noblest lesson the highest truth and that is this it is better to deserve without receiving than to receive without deserving as a matter of fact it is better to be the victim of villainy than to be a villain better to be stolen from than to be a thief and in the last analysis the oppressed the slave is less unfortunate than the oppressor the master the children of the stage these children these citizens of the mimic world are not the grasping shrewd and prudent people of the mart they are improvident enough to enjoy the present and credulous enough to believe the promises of the universal liar known as hope their hearts and hands are open as a rule genius is generous luxurious lavish reckless and royal and so when they have reached the ladder's topmost round they think the world is theirs and that the heaven of the future can have no cloud but from the ranks of youth the rival steps upon the veteran brows the wreaths begin to fade the leaves to fall and failure sadly sups on memory they tread the stage no more they leave the mimic world fair fancy's realm they leave their palaces and thrones their crowns are gone and from their hands the sceptres fall at last in age and want in lodgings small and bare they wait the prompter's call and when the end is reached maybe a vision glorifies the closing scene again they are on the stage again their hearts throb high again they utter perfect words again the flowers fall about their feet and as the curtain falls the last sound that greets their ears is the music of applause the bravos for an encore and then the silence falls on darkness end of the children of the stage a speech given by robert g ingersoll and published in volume twelve of the works of robert g ingersoll Hamlet at the Lyceum, from Reviews by Oscar Wilde, from the Project Gutenberg ebook edited by Robert Ross, transcribed from the 1908 Methuen and Company edition by David Price. 
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mary Jane Conlon. Hamlet at the Lyceum by Oscar Wilde. Dramatic Review, May 9, 1885. It sometimes happens that at a premiere in London, the least enjoyable part of the performance is the play. I have seen many audiences more interesting than the actors, and have often heard better dialogue in the foyer than I have on the stage. At the Lyceum, however, this is rarely the case, and when the play is a play of Shakespeare's, and among its exponents are Mr. Irving and Miss Ellen Terry, we turn from the gods in the gallery and from the goddesses in the stalls to enjoy the charm of the production and to take delight in the art. The lions are behind the footlights and not in front of them when we have a noble tragedy nobly acted. And I have rarely witnessed such enthusiasm as that which greeted on last Saturday night the two artists I have mentioned. I would like, in fact, to use the word ovation, but a pedantic professor has recently informed us, with the Batavian buoyancy of misapplied learning, that this expression is not to be employed except when a sheep has been sacrificed. At the Lyceum last week, I need hardly say, nothing so dreadful occurred— the only inartistic incident of the evening was the hurling of a bouquet from a box at Mr. Irving while he was engaged in portraying the agony of Hamlet's death and the pathos of his parting with Horatio. The dramatic college might take up the education of spectators as well as that of players and teach people that there is a proper moment for the throwing of flowers as well as a proper method. As regards Mr. Irving's own performance, it has been already so elaborately criticized and described, from his business with the supposed pictures in the closet scene, down to his use of peacock for paddock, that little remains to be said. Nor indeed does a lyceum audience require the interposition of the dramatic critic in order to understand or to appreciate the Hamlet of this great actor. I call him a great actor because he brings to the interpretation of a work of art the two qualities which we in this century so much desire, the qualities of personality and of perfection. A few years ago it seemed to many, and perhaps rightly, that the personality overshadowed the art, no such criticism would be fair now. The somewhat harsh angularity of movement and faulty pronunciation have been replaced by exquisite grace of gesture and clear precision of word where such precision is necessary. For delightful as good elocution is, few things are so depressing as to hear a passionate passage recited instead of being acted. The quality of a fine performance is its life more than its learning, and every word in a play has a musical as well as an intellectual value, and must be made expressive of a certain emotion. So it does not seem to me that in all parts of a play perfect pronunciation is necessarily dramatic. When the words are wild and whirling, the expression of them must be wild and whirling also. Mr. Irving, I think, manages his voice with singular art. It was impossible to discern a false note or wrong intonation in his dialogue or his soliloquies, and his strong dramatic power, his realistic power as an actor, is as effective as ever. A great critic at the beginning of this century said that Hamlet is the most difficult part to personate on the stage, that it is like the attempt to embody a shadow. I cannot say that I agree with this idea. Hamlet seems to me, essentially, 
a good acting part, and in Mr. Irving's performance of it, there is that combination of poetic grace with absolute reality which is so eternally delightful. Indeed, if the words easy and difficult have any meaning at all in matters of art, I would be inclined to say that Ophelia is the more difficult part. She has, I mean, less material by which to produce her effects. She is the occasion of the tragedy, but she is neither its heroine nor its chief victim. She is swept away by circumstances and gives the opportunity for situation of which she is not herself the climax and which she does not herself command. And of all the parts which Miss Terry has acted in her brilliant career, there is none in which her infinite powers of pathos and her imaginative and creative faculty are more shown than in her Ophelia. Miss Terry is one of those rare artists who needs, for her dramatic effect, no elaborate dialogue, and for whom the simplest words are sufficient. I love you not, says Hamlet, and all that Ophelia answers is, I was the more deceived. These are not very grand words to read, but as Miss Terry gave them in acting, they seem to be the highest possible expression of Ophelia's character. Beautiful, too, was the quick remorse she conveyed by her face and gesture the moment she had lied to Hamlet and told him her father was at home. This, I thought, a masterpiece of good acting, and her mad scene was wonderful beyond all description. The secrets of Melpomene are known to Miss Terry as well as the secrets of Thalia. As regards the rest of the company, there is always a high standard at the Lyceum, but some particular mention should be made of Mr. Alexander's brilliant performance of Laertes. Mr. Alexander has a most effective presence, a charming voice, and a capacity for wearing lovely costumes with ease and elegance. Indeed, in the latter respect, his only rival was Mr. Norman Forbes, who played either Guildenstern or Rosencrantz very gracefully. I believe one of our budding Hazlitts is preparing a volume to be entitled Great Guildensterns and Remarkable Rosencrantzes, but I have never been able myself to discern any difference between these two characters. They are, I think, the only characters Shakespeare has not cared to individualize. Whichever of the two, however, Mr. Forbes acted, he acted it well. Only one point in Mr. Alexander's performance seemed to me open to question. That was his kneeling during the whole of Polonius's speech. For this I see no necessity at all, and it makes the scene look less natural than it should, gives it, I mean, too formal an air. However, the performance was most spirited and gave great pleasure to everyone. Mr. Alexander is an artist from whom much will be expected, and I have no doubt he will give us much that is fine and noble. He seems to have all the qualifications for a good actor. There is just one other character I should like to notice. The first player seemed to me to act far too well. He should act very badly. The first player, besides his position in the dramatic evolution of the tragedy, is Shakespeare's caricature of the ranting actor of his day. Just as the passage he recites is Shakespeare's own parody on the dull plays of some of his rivals. The whole point of Hamlet's advice to the players seems to me to be lost unless the player himself has been guilty of the fault which Hamlet reprehends, unless he has sawn the air with his hand, mouthed his lines, torn his passion to tatters, and out Heroded Herod. The very sensibility which Hamlet notices in the actor, such as his real tears and the like, is not the quality of a good artist. The part should be played after the manner of a provincial tragedian. 
It is meant to be a satire, and to play it well is to play it badly. The scenery and costumes were excellent, with the exception of the king's dress, which was coarse in color and tawdry in effect. And the player queen should have come in boy's attire to Elsinore. However, last Saturday night was not a night for criticism. The theater was filled with those who desired to welcome Mr. Irving back to his own theater, and we were all delighted at his reappearance among us. I hope that some time will elapse before he and Miss Terry cross again that disappointing Atlantic Ocean. This has been Hamlet at the Lyceum from the Project Gutenberg ebook Reviews by Oscar Wilde, edited by Robert Ross, narrated by Mary Jane Conlon. The Motion Picture Shows from the Moving Picture World, Volume 3, 1908, July through December, page 154. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Motion Picture Shows Coincident with the disappearing of the saloon came the appearance of the motion picture shows. We had them before, but not in such stage of development as now. Cities in other states, where they yet have saloons also, have these shows, but not to the extent we have them here. This motion picture business is a craze which has struck the whole country but coming about the time when the saloons took their reluctant leave they stepped into greater popularity in georgia because they filled in part of void that had been created they have largely taken the place of saloons quite a number being operated in buildings that formerly were occupied by saloons this shows not only that conditions will always adjust themselves and that never a vacancy occurs which there is not something to fill if properly used but that every change that is made will lead to something better these motion picture shows must be regarded as something to supply luxuries to the people since what they furnish is not a necessity in this they are of course the same class as the bar rooms the admission price is five and ten cents according to the quality of the entertainment just as the price of a beer or a smile was five or ten cents according to the quality of the liquid joy that was called for people can't go to the saloon for entertainment as they formerly did and many of them drop in to see a moving picture show instead certainly this is better there is no objection that can possibly be urged against a moving picture show they furnish innocent amusement of a high class which the best people can and do enjoy ladies and children are constant patrons and so they are elevating instead of being degrading and demoralizing as saloons often were the young man may take his best girl to see the moving pictures and the father may take his children and his wife as many do which is far better than dropping into a saloon where the surroundings were such that ladies and children could not visit them hence it is that coming to take the place of the saloon as these moving picture shows have to a considerable extent in augusta they are to be welcomed as something good and should be encouraged and patronized from a business standpoint this applies with equal force every moving picture show in operation prevents a building from standing vacant for a time at least each of these shows gives employment to more people than the average bar room from every point of view they should be welcomed and esteemed worthy of the most liberal patronage augusta georgia herald end of the motion picture shows from the moving picture world volume three nineteen o eight july through december page one hundred and fifty four jacques offenbach by camille sansan this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marianne. 
Jacques Offenbach from Musical Memories by Camille Saint Saens. It is dangerous to prophesy. Not long ago I was speaking of Offenbach, trying to do justice to his marvelous natural gifts and deploring his squandering them. And I was imprudent enough to say that posterity would never know him. Now posterity is proving that I was wrong, for Offenbach is coming back into fashion. Our contemporaneous composers forget that Mozart, Beethoven, and Sebastian Bach knew how to laugh at times. They distrust all gaiety and declare it unesthetic. As the good public cannot resign itself to getting along without gaiety, it goes to operetta and turns naturally to Offenbach, who created it, and furnished an inexhaustible supply. My phrase is not exaggerated, for Offenbach hardly dreamed of creating an art. He was endowed with a genius for the comic and an abundance of melody, but he had no thought of doing anything beyond providing material for the theatre he managed at the time. As a matter of fact, he was almost its only author. He was unable to rid himself of his Germanic influences, and so corrupted the taste of an entire generation by his false prosody, which has been incorrectly considered originality. In addition, he was lacking in taste. At the time they affected a dreadful mannerism of always stopping on the next to the last note of a passage, whether or not it was associated with a mute syllable. This mannerism had no purpose beyond indicating to the audience the end of a passage and giving the clack the signal to applaud. Offenbach did not belong to that heroic strain to which success is the least of its cares, so he adopted this mannerism, and often his ingenuously turned and charming couplets are ruined by this silly absurdity now gone out of fashion. Furthermore, he wrote badly, for his early education was neglected. If the tales of Hoffman show traces of a practiced pen, it is because Gerald finished the score and went out of his way to remedy some of the author's mistakes. Leaving aside the bad prosody and minor defects in taste, we have left a work which shows a wealth of invention, melody, and sparkling fancy comparable to Getry's. Getry was no more a musician than Offenbach, for he also wrote badly. The essential difference between the two was the care, not only in his prosody, but also in his declamation, which Getry tried to reproduce musically with all possible exactness. He overshot the mark in this, for he did not see that in singing the expression of a note is modified by the harmonic scheme which accompanies it. It must be recognized, in addition, that many times Getry was carried away by his melodic inventiveness and forgot his own principles, so that he relegated his care for declamation to second place. What hurt Getry was his unbounded conceit, with which Offenbach, to his credit, was never afflicted. As an indication of this, he dared to write in his advice to young musicians, Those who have genius will make opera comique like mine, those who have talent will write opera like Gluck's, while those who have neither genius nor talent will write symphonies like Haydn's. However, he tried to make an opera like Gluck's, and in spite of his great efforts and his interesting inventions, he could not equal the work of his formidable rival. Although he was not a great musician, Offenbach had a surprising natural instinct, and made here and there curious discoveries in harmony. In speaking of these discoveries, I must go slightly into the history of harmony and resign myself to being understood only by those of my readers who are more or less musicians. In a slight work, Daphnis et Chloe, Offenbach risked a dominant eleventh without either introduction or conclusion, an extraordinary audacity at the time. A short course in harmony is necessary for the understanding of this. We must start with the fact that, theoretically, all dissonances must be introduced and concluded, which we cannot explain here, but this leading up to and away from have for their purpose softening the harshness of the dissonance which was greatly feared in bygone times. Take, if you please, the simple key of C natural. Do is the keynote, sol is the dominant. Place on this dominant two-thirds, C re, and you have the perfect dominant chord. Add a third, fa, and you have the famous dominant seventh, a dissonance which today seems actually agreeable. Not so long ago they thought that they ought to prepare for the dissonance. In the sixteenth century it was not regarded as admissible at all, for one hears the two notes, C, fa, simultaneously, and this seems intolerable to the ear. They used to call it the 
Diabolus en Musica. Palestrina was the first to employ it in an anthem. Opinions differ on this, and certain students of harmony pretend that the chord which Palestrina used only has the appearance of the dominant seventh. I do not concur in this view. But however the case may be, the glory of unchaining the devil in music belongs to Monteverda. That was the beginning of modern music. Later, a new third was superimposed, and they dared the chord Sol Si Re Fa La. The inventor is unknown, but Beethoven seems to have been the first to make any considerable use of it. He used the chord in such a way that, in spite of its current use today, in his works it appears like something new and strange. This chord imposes its characteristics on the second motif of the first part of the symphony in C minor. This is what gives such amazing charm to the long colloquy between the flute, the oboe, and the clarinets, which always surprises and arouses the listener, in the andante of the same symphony. Fetus, in his Traate de Harmonie, inveighed against this delightful passage. He admits that people like it, but, according to him, the author had no right to write it, and the listener has no right to admire it. Scholars often have strange ideas. Then Richard Wagner came along, and the reign of the ninth dominant took the place of the seventh. That is what gives Tannhauser and Lohengrin their exciting character, which is dear to those who demand in music above everything else the pleasure due to shocks to the nervous system. Imitators have fallen foul of this easy procedure, and with a laughable naivete imagine that in this way they can easily equal Wagner, and they have succeeded in making this valuable chord absolutely banal. By adding still another third, we have the dominant eleventh. Offenbach used this, but it has played but a small part since then. Beyond that we cannot go, for a third more and we are back to the basic note, two octaves away. But innovations in harmony are rare in Offenbach's work. What makes him interesting is his fertility in invention of melodies, and few have equaled him in this. He improvised constantly and with incredible rapidity. His manuscripts give the impression of having been done with the point of a needle. There is nothing useless anywhere in them. He used abbreviations as much as he could, and the simplicity of his harmony helped him here. As a result, he was able to produce his light works in an exceedingly short time. He had the luck to attach Madame Uglald to his company. Her powers had already begun to decline, but she was still brilliant. While she was giving a spectacular revival of Orphie au Enfer, he wrote Le Bavard for her. He was inspired by the hope of an unusual interpretation, and he so surpassed himself that he produced a small masterpiece. A revival of this work would certainly be successful if that were possible, but the peculiar merits of the creatrix of the role would be necessary, and I do not see her like anywhere. It is strange but true that Offenbach lost all his good qualities as soon as he took himself seriously, but he was not the only case of this in the history of music. Kramer and Clementi wrote studies and exercises which are marvels of style, but their sonatas and concertos are tiresome in their mediocrity. Offenbach's works, which were given at the Opera Comique, Robinson Caruso, Wert Wert, and Fantasio, are much inferior to La Chanson du Fortunio, La Belle Helene, and many other justly famous operettas. There have been several unprofitable revivals of La Belle Helene. This is due to the fact that the role of Helene was designed for Mademoiselle Schneider. She was beautiful and talented and had an admirable mezzo-soprano voice. The slight voice of the ordinary singer of operetta is insufficient for the part. Furthermore, traditions have sprung up. The comic element has been suppressed, and the piece has been denatured by this change. In Germany they conceived the idea of playing this farce seriously with an archaic stage setting. Jacques Offenbach will become a classic. While this may be unexpected, what doesn't happen? Everything is possible, even the impossible. End of Jacques Offenbach by Camille Sansen. A Bit of Ancient History by Ned Wayburn. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Bit of Ancient History from The Art of Stage Dancing. Every age has had its way of dancing. Every people has expressed itself in some form of rhythmic motion. 
The dance originally was the natural expression of the simple emotions of a primitive people. Triumph, defeat, war, love, hate, desire, appropriation of the gods of nature, all were danced by the hero or the tribe to the rhythm of beaten drums. Over 6,000 years ago, Egypt made use of the dance in its religious ritual. At a very early period, the Hebrews gave dancing a high place in their ceremony of worship. Moses bade the children of Israel dance after the crossing of the Red Sea. David danced before the Ark of the Covenant. The Bible is replete with instances showing the place of the dance in the lives of the people of that time. Greece, in its palmy days, was the greatest dancing nation the world has ever known. Here it is protected by priesthood and state, practiced by rich and poor, high and lowly born. One of the nine muses was devoted to the fostering of this particular art. Great ballets memorialized great events. Simple rustic dances celebrated the coming of the flowers and the gathering of the crops. Priestesses performed the sacred numbers. Eccentric comedy teams enlivened the streets of Athens. Philosophers taught it to pupils for its salutary effect on body and mind. It was employed to give soldiers poise, agility, and health. The dance was undoubtedly among the causes of Greek vigor of mind and body. Physicians prescribed its rhythmic exercise for many ailments. Plato specifies dancing among the necessities for the ideal republic, and Socrates urged it upon his pupils. The beauty of harmonized movements of healthy bodies, engendered by dancing, had its effect on the art of Greece. Since the days of classic Greece, scenery, music, and costume have created effects then undreamed of, but notwithstanding the lack of incidental factors. The greatness and frequency of municipal ballets, the variety of motives that dancing was made to express, combined to give Greece a rank never surpassed as a dancing nation. The Greek stage of this age was rich in scope, and for its effects drew upon poetry, music, dancing, grouping, and posing. Then came the dark ages of history, and in a degraded world dancing was saved and taken under the protection of the Christian church, where it remained for the greater part of a thousand years. The vehicle that carried the ballet group through this period was known as the spectacle. These sacred spectacles in grouping, evolution, decoration, and music possessed qualities that entitled them to a respectable place in the annals of opera ballet. The steps were primitive, but they sufficed for the times. However, the organization of the first real opera ballet conforming to standards of modern excellence did not come till the latter part of the 15th century, when Cardinal Riaro a nephew of Pope Sixtus VI, composed and staged a number of important ballet productions. But the greatest development of the modern type of ballet received its impetus under the reign of Louis XIV of France, who founded the National Ballet Academy at Paris in 1661, and often played prominent parts himself. Under this influence, great performers began to appear, artists whose work, by grace of beauty alone, attested that perfection in ballet technique was approaching. The growth of the ballet since the time of Louis XIV has been the contribution of individual artists, who by giving expression to their own original ideas, have thus advanced the art to the pinnacle attained by the modern Russian ballet of today. The above outline of the history of the dance is made brief intentionally, with no attempt to touch upon the various forms of dancing as practiced by the many nations and tribes. Numerous books have been written covering all aspects of this subject and giving in detail the steps and rhythms of the people of every age and of every continent and the isles of the sea. And as matters of interest, education and research, they are competent and complete and especially edifying to the student of Terpsichore. But the subject that interests us is not concerned with ancient lore nor the historical data, however delightful they may be. I am writing for the American of today about present-day matters in the American theatrical world, and to that end choose to ignore all other phases of the subject. In our day, the development of the dance has reached its greatest heights in both the social circle and the stage picture. The advance made in stage dancing within the last generation has been very pronounced, yet so gradual it has been this growth and improvement that only the elders of the present time can visualize its progress, and that only by a backward look to the period of paucity and monotony that ruled in their junior years and contrast the dearth of them with the abundance of now for really whether in our multitude of reviews or in our many musical shows the dance the pose the rhythm 
and the melody that enhance our delight are all part of the modern art of stage dancing and it is of this art that the writer seeks to tell the story in the present volume both the theatre and the dance have had their abundant historians the dance is ages older than the theatre the time of the coming of the dance to the theatre and their fitting union ever after has been recorded they have advanced together hand in hand through the years since their first meeting and are closer companions at this hour than ever before stage dancing is no longer the haphazard stepping of feet to music that it was in the beginning from its earlier crude efforts it has developed into a modern art a profession of the first class calling for brain and ability at their very best its devotees giving years of labor to perfecting themselves in their chosen art end of a bit of ancient history by ned wayburn recording by april 6090 california united states of america the dance and the drama by ned wayburn this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Dance and the Drama from the Art of Stage Dancing The art of acting, as it has been known for thousands of years, derives from the dance, and is a direct evolution from the representation of the emotions, as portrayed by the primitive dancers. Joy, anger, love, jealousy, hatred, revenge, triumph, and defeat were all interpreted in the Grecian dances of the period, antedating the introduction of the speaking actors who told in words and gestures the stories that had formerly been conveyed through the dance. The victorious warriors returned from battle dance to show how they had fought and destroyed the enemy. The hunter described in a dance how he had slain wild animals. The traveler who had visited what to him were distant lands told of the strange people he had met by imitating them while he danced. Gradually, there was evolved the addition of spoken words supplementing the action, accompanied by appropriate gestures and facial expression. Man had discovered his ability to become for the moment another person, and to interpret certain emotions more vividly than through the medium of the dance. The stage became the opportunity not only for the representation of elemental forces and actions, but also for the principal creations of the imagination. While the slowly developing drama departed widely from the limitations of its origin, there has nevertheless remained an association with the dance that will continue for all time. Especially is this true of the lighter branch of the drama, comedy, and the modern combination known as musical comedy or comic opera. In the popular stage entertainments of the day, dancing forms an important feature of a large percentage of all productions that appear in the leading theaters. In many of the classical plays, by great dramatists that are annually chosen for revivals, the dance appears, and the actor or actress who cannot dance misses many opportunities for profitable engagements. There has always been a kinship between the dance and the legitimate drama, and many prominent stars begin their apprenticeship for the stage in the ranks of musical comedy or as vaudeville dancers. With few exceptions, it will be found that the men and women who have achieved success on the stage are enthusiastic devotees of dancing, and they will agree that to those intending to make acting their life work, a thorough training in the art of dancing is an essential part of their education. End of the Dance and the Drama by Ned Wayburn Recorded by April 6090 California, United States of America The Melting Part of the Dance by Ned Wayburn. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Melting Pot of the Dance From the Art of Stage Dancing A great deal is being talked and written about changing the millions who have come to this country from foreign lands, or are the children of immigrants into 100% Americans. So far as advocacy of measures for this purpose is based on a sincere desire to bring home to everyone living under the national flag a knowledge of the essential principles of our government and institutions, this is worthy of the encouragement and aid of all patriotic citizens. 
there is however another aspect of the americanization movement that is not so admirable this is the attack on ideas manners customs and amusements peculiar to certain foreign peoples not because they are necessarily wrong or antagonistic to genuine americanism but merely because they are different according to some of these self-constituted authorities the way to instill patriotism and love of country into the benighted aliens is to persuade them to abandon all that links them with the land of their ancestors and become exactly like the prevailing type of bangor maine augusta georgia or portland oregon oliver wendell holmes tells how when he was a boy living in cambridge massachusetts there was a constant warfare between the boys of his district and those who lived down by the waterfront who were regarded as foreigners because they seemed to be in some way different he concluded that most of the racial antagonisms and hatreds that so often lead to quarrels and war are due to the same notion that the foreign man is inferior because his ways are different from ours against the narrow ideas that would reject many things of great value because they are of foreign origin there is need for a wise and discriminating selection of the best that all regions of the earth have to offer in the domain of science literature music painting the dance and other arts and their combination with the results attained by american creative effort in no respect is there a more urgent need for the development of a truly american art spirit than in the wide field offered by artistic dancing yet it would surely be a mistake to ignore all that has been learned and accomplished in the long experience of other peoples a foolish prejudice against foreign dances should not be allowed to prevent the incorporation of their best features into what will ultimately be the distinctive american school that there assuredly will be an essentially american type of dancing in all its branches that will reach heights far above that yet achieved by any other country cannot be doubtful as the increase of wealth not only for a few but for the great mass of the people gives more leisure creates new desires and brings increased capacity for enjoyment it is inevitable that more and more will the public appreciation of the dance call for still greater advances as the various races from other lands have mingled their several qualities and gifts and have produced the highest civilization on a broad scale that the world has ever seen so will the creators of new and more beautiful dance forms utilize the characteristic dances of all nations in achieving what will be one hundred percent american dance End of the Melting Pot of the Dance by Ned Weyburn Read by April 6090, California, United States of America